Hey guys, welcome to Relationship Reflections Podcast. I'm Lexi Rosado, but today I have a super, super special guest. I'm super pumped to have Pastor Peter. He is a father, a husband, yes. <laughs> um, been a pastor for eight years, and you were the pastor I interned under. Come on. <laughs> and an incredible leader, incredible leader. And so thank you for being on the podcast today. Dude, it is good to be on the podcast. Yeah. This is so weird. This is awesome. It's so weird because, because we have so many conversations and now people are about to eavesdrop on our conversations. And that's what I love. And um, by the way, excuse me that I'm on my phone for those that are watching over video, but um, it's because I'm looking at my notes because I, it's funny. I feel like we could talk about anything. And so before we get into things today, people who don't know you have to learn you. So tell us a little bit about who is Pastor Peter Reeves. Okay, let's start here. 100% African-American, half African, half American, okay? Um, my parents are uh, or were um, a, a part of the, the U.S. They came, One came from Liberia. Uh, my mom was in Zambia. And uh, they came to work for the United Nations. That's how we ended up in the U.S. because we were overseas for a really long time. My dad was the interim ambassador uh, to Ethiopia. Uh, come from a family that did not know the Lord whatsoever. Uh, and when my parents got settled in New York after they came back from serving uh, in Ethiopia, they gave their life to Jesus. And that changed my life forever. So I grew up in New York for a little bit. Then I grew up really in my adolescence, teen years in Philly. And so I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan. I'm a, I'm a Phillies fan. They're in the World Series right now. God's good. And uh, I no, give them a shout out. It's been a long time. And uh, I am. I am passionate about seeing other people win. I love Jesus and I love seeing other people win. And so my life's mission really is how do I help the people around me get to the next level in everything, in faith, yeah. in life, in relationships. Uh, I'm an advocate of people of all kinds, especially uh, my wife is a really strong leader, really strong women in, women in ministry. Mm -hmm. So I feel really called to champion that. And I think that's a little bit of what brought us together as well, too, is I just believe in people. Yeah, that's what I'm about. We should really talk about how we connected. So I, at the time, was working in the city of Lansing, but I was working for myself. I was a videographer, started yes. my own marketing company. Would see you at coffee shops. You had just gotten hired. Yeah, and I would run into you. And then when COVID hit, it was like that was kind of the shift where I was like, you know, the world was there was so much polarization like between church, unchurch, race, um, like all these issues. And then I was like, who should I talk to? <laughs> and the person I chose to talk to was you and Joanna. We did yeah. like a, a FaceTime call. I remember that. And it's interesting how you really are somebody who push people forward because it was kind of an opportunity where it was like, either I'm gonna step out of faith or I'm stepping in. Yeah. And you would encourage me to go to Mount Hope Leadership School. I ended up saying, I remember when the Lord, I, I sat on it for a long time, y'all. But I remember when the Lord had said like, to be discipled under you. And um, that's actually kind of a, a thing I want to communicate to people. I was 28 years old when God had asked me to go submit to my leadership and go back to school. Yeah, that that's how I knew it was serious. And by the way, that's not the first encouragement I gave you. The first encouragement I gave you when I first met you, so I said, I think you could do my job. You did say that to me. And I, and I noticed that you were like, one of, you were just one of those people that, you you knew that some people believed in you, but you definitely knew some people did it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I felt like when I first met you, I was just like, I need to tell you this. And I think maybe that was the catalyst that you were like, maybe I should I should talk to him a little bit more. But I saw it in you. I still see it in you. And thank obviously you. you're doing great things. So. And thank you. And yeah. thank you for believing in me. And I can vouch that you totally champion women and you cha champion leadership and pushing people forward. So that's what you're passionate about. Why do you think you're so passionate about both of those topics, women in ministry and then leadership and ministry and how they intersect. Yeah, yeah. Passionate about leadership because leaders changed my life. Like, my, obviously, uh, growing up in a home with ambitious parents, which is obviously a privilege, it's also a little bit of a curse as well, too, because they weren't around, right? To be ambitious, Ooh. you got to be on the go. Um, and so one of the people that really transformed my life from the rip was my a leader in my life, my youth pastor. His name was Chris Ranson, a really mm -hmm. great man. It's the story I always tell about him. You know, I got into a little bit of trouble Tell the school. story. Okay, this is getting story. to know Pastor okay, Peter Reeves. I'll tell the story. So I got into a little bit of fight at school, right? You're in Philly. I'm 5'7", a tall 5'7". How old are you? I'm like 14 years old. T 
tall 5'7", okay? 14-year-old 5'7". And uh, I get into a little a little argument with some kids at school. I'm not a fighter. I'm a biter. I bit a few people, okay? So I bit <laughs> some people. Uh, I'm talking about hard, okay? And uh, I got suspended, and my parents were actually out of the country on a trip, again, being ambitious. And my youth pastor was my emergency contact. Sidebar, I would never be an emergency contact for anybody. That's crazy, except for my wife and kids. Like, I just think that's such a big commitment. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And he, he committed to me. Anyway. So I get in a, in a scruffle. I'm, I'm at uh, school. I get suspended. He picks me up, uh, which I was terrified for this moment because my youth pastor was white. He pastored an all-black youth ministry. And I was like, what do white people do to their kids when they're upset? Like, I was terrified. Okay? Wow. So he picks me up. And uh, he, I'm like, what is he going to do? You know, he, I just became a student leader in the ministry. Like, for real. So You're I just thinking I'm going to get in trouble. Exactly. I just became a student leadership, but I'm like trying to rationalize in my head like how I'm going to talk to him. I'm like, PC, you told me to leave my mark on the school, and I did. You see what I'm saying? I bit people. But, you know, anyway. <laughs> but, like, I, I really, I was so terrified of the moment. And he picked me up, and he took me to McDonald's. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I texted my friend. I was like, in white families, when you get in trouble, they take you to McDonald's. Like, that's amazing. You know what I mean? And he would text I, I would get in trouble every day because I love McNuggets. And I was like, bro, <laughs> this is crazy. So he takes me to the he takes me to McDonald's. He sits me down. And I'm like, what, what is about to happen? And he says to me, Peter, the Lord spoke to me. And I was like, can we order? You know, so can we order before you tell me what the Lord spoke to you? So we order. And he tells me, the Lord told me um, that you're going to be in ministry. Literally, I just got suspended from school. Mm. I'm terrified to have a conversation with him. And he said, the Lord told me that you're going to be in the ministry. And I said, Pastor Chris, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Okay? Because I just got in trouble at school. I'm I'm biting people. And you're talking about going to the ministry. But he saw something in me even before there was any inclination that there was something there. And that transformed my life, that one conversation. So that helped me learn right off the rip that leadership is conversations. That conversation right. changed my life. He was the first person to really impact me. And he wasn't just a great pastor. He didn't just listen to me or lead me to Jesus. He taught me how to live life. And he was the first person to believe in me. So I think that's why I approach every moment of leadership like that one conversation that changed my life after a terrible yeah. moment. That's why I love to find people in the worst yeah. of moments too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like when they don't see anything in themselves, where they're really down on themselves, where they, they're just ready. They want to come in and like repent or like come in and be hidden. And I'm like, no, 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 you, 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 you. You You're do lead one. like that. Yeah, because he did it for me. In one of my worst moments, mm. and now I still had to respond to my African, my right, can I met After I had this moment with my youth pastor, he calls life out of me. You're going to go into the ministry. I, I felt so free. And <laughs> then light. you go back to mama. And, and then I picked up the phone. My mom called me. She's like, what are you doing? Where? You are going to come. You know, like she's just going crazy on me. I'm like, wow, okay, this is what's happening. But Pastor Chris saw me in that moment. That changed my life. So I lead every moment of my life from that one conversation. Yeah, no, and I, I see that you do, you call out identity in people, and even as a leader, an intern that was under you, like, you call us to call people higher. Yes. I love That's that. How we do it. I love that story. Who would have thought that you would become who you are today? Pastor Chris. <laughs> and when I saw him, too, mm. like, when I saw him a year ago, mm-hmm. he was the only person in the room not shocked by what God was doing in my life. Because he had the foresight. Thank God. Dude, this is what this is why I think leadership is so important, not to be so so preachy, but Paul says you have many teachers amongst you. There's gonna be a lot of people that wanna teach you something, yeah. especially in our day of social media influencers, right? People trying to teach you something, even in the 30, 15 seconds they can get you. But you don't have many fathers, Paul says. And Pastor Chris was a father. And that's why being a leader, it doesn't really it's not really about age and it's not really about experience it's about desire and heart mm-hmm. you know like you could be really experienced but be a jerk and no one's going to want to be fathered by you or mothered by you yeah. you know what i mean and so like that that's what it's about for me um and that's why i'm really passionate about it and let's go there let's go there what does it mean to be a ministry leader you're saying a father yeah what does that mean like what advice would you give to people that are leaders now yeah what's the difference well you have to care about people more than what they do Mm. Right. You have to know their story, know their history, know their background. I kind of use like this threefold thing that's kind of helped me connect with anyone, no matter where they come from, race, sexual orientation, whatever it is. These three questions have kind of helped me really connect with people. Just call them the three F's like I want to know about your family. I want to know about your faith and I want to know what you're hoping for for your future. Right. Those kind of three things. And that's kind of helped me. That's what fathers do. 
right? Fathers are helping you shape your faith, your belief system, your values. They're helping you think about uh, your family, why this family is so important. Like as a new dad, my daughter's only two, but I literally did this today, getting her ready to go uh, over to her nanny's house. And I literally say, hey, look at your mom, look at your brother Mac, look at me, this is your family. That's what dads do, yeah. right? We're trying to get it. Every time she sees her little brother, she's like, Mackie. I'm like, you protect Mac. I'm reminding, I'm reinstilling, reinforcing in her that this is her family and this is how we take care of our family. And then lastly, her future. Like my, as a res- my responsibility is to help my daughter dream beyond what she can comprehend for her future. And we do that for individuals. So what being a father looks like is not just reaching objectives and goals. That's what a leader does. And we need that too. We need to be a boss at some point. Right, reaching goals and objectives yeah. and metrics and statistics, all that is really important. But fathers help shape your faith, help give you a picture yeah. of family, and help you think and dream for your future. That's so good. That's what they do. How have you changed as a leader as you've walked out that methodology? Yeah, uh, my compassion for people has gone to a different level. Um, I think this is sometimes why it's hard for people to lead from a father's heart because you get exposed to the difficulties in people's lives, mm, yeah. right? Like if you're actually listening, you realize, and, and we as leaders kind of hate this word because we're like, oh, that's not our jurisdiction. We talk about faith. When people start using words like trauma, trauma. and deep pain, we're like, oh, no, no, no. But when you start listening to people, which actually is a major pastoral skill, it's the ministry of listening, which we all hate. We would rather talk, right? Um, you start to realize that people are actually going through a lot of difficult things and moments. And uh, it's changed me significantly because everyone's not on my schedule and on my timeline and at my pace, you know, and as a, Mm. that as a father, you have to learn like, okay, I'm not comparing my daughter to another two year old. She's my two year old. She's significant. She's individualistic. It's different. And I just got to walk with her through it. So it's changed me a lot uh, since doing that. I've I've become way more compassionate uh, as I'm listening to people. Yeah. Speaking of like walking alongside people, um, I'm I'm really intrigued on how ministry and leadership kind of come together. And part of my hesitation in jumping into ministry or being a leader in ministry was I was like, what happens if I fall morally? Mm -hmm. What happens if there's this like standard that I almost feel like sometimes our humanity isn't welcomed? And you've really welcomed, I feel like, my humanity and a lot of people as as in their struggle, right? Walking alongside people. But as a pastor, especially honestly in the last few years, we've seen pastors fall morally. How do you reconcile that? And how 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 do you navigate through that? How does yeah. that impact you as a leader? Yeah. Yeah, it impacts me greatly because these are not just individuals. They're yeah. they're they're men and women of God still. Their failure doesn't make them not a man or woman of God. Mm -hmm. The decisions they made over the course of their life make them a woman. One moment doesn't define them forever, right? Right. Right. But they're they're leaders and they're and they're examples that are still a big deal. So when they fall, it it hurts. It's a it's um it's intense, you know. Right. Right. But I'll say it like this: like it doesn't shatter my faith. Like this is why I think every single person on the planet, I really stress for them to to really hear the voice of the Lord for themselves. That's like my major discipleship strategy. Like, it's like, well, how do I become a follower of Jesus? I don't know, listen for his voice every day. Like, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're watching, right. read the Bible, pray, I don't know, but no matter what you're doing, just listen for his voice. Because those voices are important and pivotal, but they're not the loudest voice in my life. So the fact that Come they're on. not there anymore, it still stings, but it doesn't break my faith. Right. But like it always blows my mind when people are like I can't follow Jesus anymore because my favorite pastor, you know, fell. I'm like, well, who were you following? Like, were you just following that pastor or were you right. following Jesus? Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Right. Not to be preached again, but the, Paul's in other words is saying the only reason you should follow me is because I'm following Christ. So in other Come words, on. if I'm not following Christ, then don't follow me. So you get that? Yeah. So it's no. like, you know, please do. <laughs> but it's like, you know, Siri that, wants that, to be a part of this. <laughs> Siri, we don't need you right now. We don't you're need fa- you right you're now. a false prophet. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but just like those leaders are, they're great. They're fan- they're fantastic. And I hope for their comeback. Their triumph story will be beautiful, but Come on. it doesn't shake my faith because they're not the loudest voice in my life. That's so good. And what things do you have in your life to help, to help protect how, what 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 practices do you have in your life that keep you rooted? Yeah. So first off, I never listen to a message without going back to review it, 
right? Like I want to make sure Ooh. that I want to make sure like if if it's really especially a message that impacted me that I'm like, wow, that's really good. I'm going to build some of my life off of this. I'm going to go, okay, well, they read these verses. Let me go back and read them. And sometimes I've come to found like, wow, actually, that's what the, the scripture says and I need to adjust. Or I've come and be like, that was really good and sexy what they said, but it's actually not what the Bible's talking about. Come on. And so when you get into the habit and the practice of testing what you're hearing, that's a big practice. Actually, right, here the scripture says, faith comes by hearing. Mm-hmm. So if that's the case, right, and, and we know it's impossible to please God without faith, the most important thing in my life is to protect my hearing. What is happening? (laughs) The most important thing that I have to protect is my hearing. That's like the goal because that's the only way faith comes. So another really important practice in my life is like paying attention to who I let speak into my life, what I'm actually listening to. Mm. You know, one of my practices that has kept me grounded is my news intake. Come on. I don't need to hear all the negative reports. I want to know what's going on in the world. I want to be relevant. But I also don't need to hear the negative report every single day because that dilutes my faith. Faith comes by hearing. You know what I mean? Um, another practice I, I really have in my life is I have people in my life that can tell me no. Come on. Right? So I might have I might have an idea of like I listen to a sermon or, or something. Then I have voices to um, – kind of reflect in my life that I reflect on what I just heard with. And that's a really important practice in my life. I'm like, I heard so-and-so say this. What do you think? And they're going, no, don't don't think that. I'm like, okay, great. That's the end of it. You know what I mean? Like people I really trust um, that can tell me no. And You're we, the first pastor that told me that. That you should have someone in your life that could tell yeah, you no. Yeah, and that really was revolutionary in me becoming who I am because – I run my own company. I have my own team. So who in my circle could tell me no? And there were practices I put in place after we had talked. Like my administrative assistant has access to all my things. Yeah. Every DM message, you're you're messaging Marley as well. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, certainly. And that accountability exists. Be, it's because there's someone there to tell me no. Yeah, but everybody who has done anything significant in the Bible has someone who could tell them no. Every, everybody, right? Like I just, on that. I, just, I just read today, like 2 Samuel 24, David, who was literally like the greatest king of all of Israel, so much so, like God holds David in such high respects that he literally calls Jesus the son of David. Mm. You know what I mean? So this guy's obviously like a pivotal figure in like the Bible and like, you know, the Lord cares about this man a lot and says he's the only man who ever like was after my heart truly. Uh, and one in one moment where David makes a mistake, the Lord says he speaks to the prophet Gad, David's spiritual advisor. Because even if you're the greatest king in Israel, you still need an advisor. Come on. So he's a spiritual advisor. And the Lord speaks to him to tell him to say what to David. And you're like, well, why didn't just God speak to David? Because the Lord is really big on having other people in your life that can speak to you and tell you no. And that's exactly what Gad did. He said, listen, David, you made a mistake. This is what the Lord is saying. And this is what you need to do. Mm, For, heard, yeah, anyway. That's so good. I heard something recently that said, um, I don't know who said it, but they said that every shepherd still needs to be a sheep. All day. All day. And that's what you're saying. And if you're the type of shepherd that doesn't see yourself as a sheep anymore, then the Lord is not your shepherd. Cool. Psalm you know 23, you're just that's popping it. it out. No, but for real mm. though, shepherds who don't want to be sheep will lead their sheep into dangerous places. Come on. It's serious. Yeah. Ooh. And I think that's what happens, though, is like we you talk about pastors who fall. Um, th- this was a series of decisions. This wasn't just one moment, but they un- intent- unintentionally preached something that they didn't live. They were a shepherd leading their sheep down a path that they themselves weren't following. And that's what makes it dicey. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And you said you were afraid, you know, of going into leadership because you might fail. Like, what if I that's the risk? That yeah. is the risk, and yeah. that's why we're all dependent, you know what I mean, on the Lord. Like, what are we going to do? You know, we're we're humans. Like, this is we, – we are reaching our maximum capacity on, like, yeah. when we step into leadership. Like, God, I need you to help me. And so I think it's a risk. I think anyone could fall. I think we all need to be aware of that. Yeah. And the moment you think you're not going to fall, that's probably when you're going to fall. But – Well, even right now I'm having, like, a God moment because now I'm seeing full circle, right? Like, the biggest fears that, that I had made me not want to get in to ministry, but submitting to somebody was becoming a sheep. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's really good. So that's so good was becoming a sheep. Yeah. Um, one thing that you touched on that I want us to like get into is under your internship, I learned so much about going to God first. 
There were so little little tips and big tips. And you're a leader that I want to just be in the room even if I'm not led by you in that moment. So even recently, there was a meeting you had with your new leader. I was like, I'm just here to sit and learn. I just want to yeah. listen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's always stories you share, but there's a story that stuck out to me. Um, and you're sharing that a pastor in particular, and I'm probably going to butcher it, so maybe I should have you say it. But there was a, a pastor in particular who kind of built that small group model. And mm -hmm. his church grew exponentially. And now all of a sudden, all these other churches started to follow the same model. But you were like, catch this. He was hearing from God. So they're all falling on the byproduct of something. Mm -hmm. But the real, the real win or the real solution, yep. the real director was hearing from God, not the small group model. Yeah. So can you speak to that about hearing from God and what practices we need to have as ministry leaders? Why that's so crucial? Yeah, we we want the results so the we, stage right we can do all the we we want to do what we see other people doing because we're like if they had success like doing it this way i can have success success doing it this way and that's because we a lot of us we don't serve the savior we serve success right oh hold and on like, say that again we don't <laughs> serve the savior we serve success yeah we do because Ooh, we pray for success idol. we hope for success we love following successful people um Everything is about success. And if we don't feel like we're a success, then we feel like a mess, right? Like it's like success drives the way we feel. So wow. um, what, what I was trying to specify when I was sharing that story is that that leader had a specific problem in his community, the pastor who started this small group model. And he, he spent time on his knees and in prayer and fasting, asking God for a solution for heaven, for what to do for his specific people. He experienced great success because he actually heard from God and everyone else just tried to do what he did, not understanding that the people that God sent to them were maybe in a different position or a different place or needed a different thing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the internship was structured on not doing what I say, but hearing from the Lord because that that's what we all need. Like I can give you some tips and some practices that could help set you up for a great life. That's awesome. But if you don't hear specifically about what God's asking you to do and what he's calling you to do, one of my favorite things to do in ministry is to tear down the barrier that you, that people have set between themselves and pastors. Like, Oh, they can do that. And I can't, or they hear from God and I can't, I'm like, no, you can hear exactly. The Bible says he wants to, he wants to hear, let him hear. You want to hear, you can hear. It's just tearing down those barriers, allowing people to understand that they can walk into the presence of the Lord for themselves. This is in the Old Testament. There's not like priests with like lambs and a, tur and a curtain. Like you can go in and hear from God mm -hmm. for yourself. And that's actually the most important piece of living a life of faith is hearing so the voice good. of God consistently. So good. Let's talk about the art of leadership. It's an art. That's why I say I'm an artist. So tell me about the art of leadership, no, you art artist. Okay, but seriously, leadership is an art because it, it's it's a, an expression, right, that is formulated in different ways. That's all art is, right? Like I could see something uh, or make something um, that I find appealing and that other people find appealing. And you could be like, I don't like it. It's all about interpretation as well, mm -hmm. too. The same is true for, for leadership. And uh, the art of leadership to me is is one focal point. It's how do I pull the best out of people out of people? And that's done so many different ways. That's true. Because everybody's so different. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And most of what we do when we start and we use the word leadership is we think factory, right? Because like we're we're an industrious culture. So I'm like, how do I make as many as many leaders as possible as quickly as possible because right. it's a stats. Exactly. But that's not it. That's not it at all. That's not it at all. So the art, of, the art, yeah, the art of leadership is pulling the best out of people, um, and using a variety of different methods to do that. And so for me, uh, that's the challenge. That's why I love what I get to do because it is centered on faith. This isn't just leadership; it's faith leadership. So the core is having a relationship with Jesus, but then from there, I'm teaching, I'm serving people and teaching them how to serve everyone else around them. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. so good. What are some of the the stuff that you teach in our to us as leaders? Yeah, yeah. Fifty percent of leadership is showing up. What's the other percentage? <laughs> Do you not know? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. I'm like, hold on. Twenty five percent is creating moments. Yes. Uh, what's the last twenty five percent? Fifty percent showing up. Twenty five. Creating moments. Twenty five percent showing care. Showing care. Yes. Duh. Oh, so that, let me I don't that. have to remorize that one because I am that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I live that. I live that. I am care. Okay, 50% showing up. <laughs> Think about how many times or how many people 
expected someone to show up for them and that person didn't show up. So true. That's, that, that's a practice we're lacking in the church. We want people to show up to our building. All of our marketing is come here. But you know what's crazy? Family is, it's funny. We call the medical emergency company 911 when something happens. Family should be, I call somebody in my church family and they show up. Exactly. Exactly. That's so good. Exactly. But we don't, we don't do that, right? Right. Um, I think it's so important. One of the most, one of the like last moments that Jesus had on earth after he was like raised from the dead is it, and it says this phrase, the disciples were all together, they were grieving and he showed up in their midst. Come on. Right. So that's where that percentage comes for. If I can get people to understand like when I'm teaching them how to be a leader, that you just got to show up. True. Right? In a practical context in our youth ministry, it's like be in the room, be in the room on time, be in the room ready to go, be in the room with energy, right? Show up for people. Be engaging, right? That's 50% of it. If you could get if you could get that, you're 50% on your way to becoming a great leader. Just yeah. show up. Show up in people's lives. When they call you, don't wait. Days and days and days to text them back. Text them back as quickly as you can. Return their call. Yeah. You know what I mean? Protect your life, but also just show up for people. Okay, 25% creating moments. I don't really remember any of the messages my youth pastor preached. And if he's hearing this, I'm really sorry. I'm going to share it. And if he hears it, I, he's going to be really upset. I don't really remember any of the messages, but I remember the McDonald's moments. Right. I, remember mom- I remember the hiking moments. I don't hike. That is not my favorite activity. But I remember he would take us hiking, and on those hiking trips, he would drop spiritual nuggets and gems. And I don't remember what he said, but I remember the moments and him speaking life into me and taking me up the mountain. I remember the boating trips. I remember sitting with him at a Dairy Queen. I remember the moments. Um, Life is lived and measured in moments. Right. Yeah. When you think about your life, you think about moments when you go to a funeral, they show the moments in people's lives. Right. Um, and so that's why 25 percent of leadership is creating a moment for someone. I need to create moments for them. I need to help them. One of my favorite way to create, create moments is just to simply buy someone something, whether it's like uh, whether it's something intentional, not just like, oh, I bought you this shirt. Like I didn't put any intentionality to it, but like they said something and then I bought them a shirt that enforced what they were saying. Right. right. Just doing something for someone or dropping off a coffee. Come on. We know coffee is a lot of people's love language. Right. Like, Amen. That's especially in the church. Exactly. Right. <laughs> like it's like, listen, we don't do drugs. We just do caffeine. Um, like which is still a excessively. Drug. <laughs> but it's like that. That is like I'm just trying to create a moment for them so that um so that they can have something to reflect on. And that's when we grow. So we create moments because people reflect on them and reflection is actually where we grow. So as yeah. important as um, helping people go to the Lord is important, the other really important part of art of leadership is like self-discovery. And self-discovery only happens when people are reflecting. So I want to create moments so people can reflect. And when mm-hmm. they reflect, they grow. And then the last part, showing care, is like I need to be inquisitive and curious about what's going on in people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. Not just listening, because listening is important. I already talked about that, but I want to be inquisitive. I want to be curious because I, I want to be the type of person that walks into the room and says, there you are, not here I am. You know what I mean? And I got to I gotta dig. Ooh, let's slow down on that. There you are, not here I am. Yeah, there's two types of people. There's people that walk into the room and they're great and they're a big deal. And they when they walk walk into the room, they're like, here I am. Right. And they expect people to come up to them. If no one comes up to them, they go, I don't feel welcome. I don't feel accepted. I don't feel loved. But then there's the type of people that understand like, whoa, no, no, I am a there you are kind of person. So I walk into the room and I'm not looking for who's going to greet me. I'm going to go greet people and I'm going to host every environment I'm in. Uh, And that's what showing care is about, you know, being curious about other people. That's so good. I'm like slowing down in that wisdom because... It's so easy. And that goes back to that father part, right? Yeah, certainly. When you have that mindset to father, to be a part of transforming other people instead of you being the show. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm sitting with that. I'm sitting with that. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to talk about? I mean, I I always just want to talk about the tension I see right now. You know, I just read this story. I, I've been reflecting on this like crazy. Mm-hmm. I think I told I told it to you about this because it, it doesn't even make sense to me that someone could actually do this, but it's a true story. There was this young lady who wanted a nose job. Mm-hmm. Did you hear about this? I don't know. Okay, she wanted a nose job, and um, she she had just recently been pregnant, so she was feeling pretty down on her body, and she wanted a nose job, and so 
She takes her baby and sells her baby for thirty six hundred dollars, so that she could get a nose job. Stop! I did not hear this. Yes, story. this is a crazy story. It's like been on national TV. It's like it's wild, and I'm reflecting on this story, and everyone is like going crazy on this this lady. Like, how could you? How could you do that? And we all agree, like what she did was wrong. None of us would say that's acceptable. Mm-hmm. We're all like, bro, mm-hmm. this is crazy. But then the Lord started to speak to me, like, how many people do that same exact thing? just spiritually or with the good ideas they have, right? They care more about their appearance in front of other people Mm -hmm. than they do with what they're actually producing, which is why a lot of us are making the decisions we're making. We're making them so that we can look good, not because we want to reproduce in the people coming after us or because we want to build something of significance. We care more about appearance than legacy. So you didn't ask me anything about this, but this is what is like consuming all of my thoughts that we're living in days where people care about how they look, but they don't care about what they're leaving behind. And I'm really cognizant of that. About to turn 30 this year. I you think you beat me to it. Feliz uh, cumpleaños. Yes, you beat me to it. But I'm just so, I'm just so um, overwhelmed by that. Like, I have to leave a legacy behind. I can't just care about how I look right now. Right. And all the scriptures that are, like, formative, but also I don't like to quote them because it makes me, like, have to think about it but it's like don't despise the day of small beginnings we all hate small beginnings we want to look good today we want to mm, look good come now on. Come we don't want to have to do the heavy lifting or the hard work or the right. the behind the scenes to see whatever we're trying to do grow to leave a legacy behind and i just got done watching this uh documentary wow. from the ceo of whole foods uh, who's an interesting individual but he just said yeah there was 10 or 15 years where i didn't have i didn't have time to show off what i had Because it wasn't about showing off what I have. And now it's not. Now it's about helping the next generation create good ideas. He goes, but that everything I wanted was on the other side of me being hidden and trying to figure out how to build a legacy. And I thought, wow, how can somebody who doesn't even know Jesus have a revelation that great when us as the people of God are not even, I feel like, there sometimes? That's so good, especially for the next gen, right? Because they're growing up in a space where it is about who you're showing of who you are today. But... And I'll share this. When I worked in TV news, who I was then is totally different Different, than the woman I am now. Yeah, yeah. And I was so proud of the woman I was then. But no, like we can be spiritually bankrupt. Yeah. But elevated in the world. Yeah. But the truth is being spiritually cared for and nurtured and the legacy. I love that is so much more impactful and greater. It certainly is. It certainly is. And then the, the last thing I've been thinking about is, you know, the, the Bible says that Jesus came in grace and in truth. Mm-hmm. And if we mess this up, we will miss the generation that is doing whatever they want to do. And it's why they're not coming to faith. In grace and truth. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. It says Jesus Christ came in grace and truth. And the order is really, really important. Ooh. It's really important. It's not truth and grace. Grace. And, and then truth. truth, right? I have to grace in the situation is not letting people how live however they want. Mm-hmm. Grace is listening to them mm-hmm. and trying to hear their perspective. And once I listen to them and I hear their perspective and I understand, if they're interested, I'm going to share truth with them. If they're not interested, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna throw the pearls at them. You know what I mean? These are pearls I'm holding on to, mm. truth. But I'm going to listen. I'm going to show you grace. But if you want to grow, then I'll give you truth. You know what I mean? And and because we're we're kind of messing that up right now, we're like, yo. We're losing people. Yeah, we're like, let's do the truth thing and just truth, no grace, because we've given enough grace. Well, the, where, I, where I read the Bible, it says where sin abounds, grace abounds more. I see a lot of sin. So right. this grace needs to abound and abound and abound. And once I have relation with people, I will give them truth if they want to grow. And you need relational equity to give truth that's going to be heard that makes change. Like people have to, and I say this all the time, belong, and then be known, yeah. then be challenged. If you're not known and you don't belong, it's hard to be challenged yeah. to be changed to action. Yeah. I'm in seminary right now, and I a word that I was shocked that I learned in like Hebrew for the word obedience is Shema. Yeah. And the meaning of Shema actually means to listen so closely um, that you you hear what's under the surface. Mm. And it made me reread these scriptures about obeying God differently because it was like, wow, we have to be so close that we hear and we see what's under the surface. But then I, I was I was really feeling 
I'm learning all these Hebrew words, right? This Hebrew word karav, which means near. So um, when it says God is near to the brokenhearted, and I'll tie it all together. But when it says when you're near, near to the brokenhearted, it means within reach. Yeah. So I was like, as I was learning obey and near in Hebrew, it's like in order for us to actually get ministry to the root and the fullness of what it really meant in the scripture, yeah. we have to have that relational that relational space where you're within reach with people, yeah. where you're hearing to the point you're under, what's underneath the surface. And we're doing that with one another and we're doing that with God. Yeah. And that goes to exactly what you're saying. <laughs> that's so beautiful. But that's the only way to execute grace well. Yeah, yeah. Is to really be and that is so be funny. there. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is interesting that you're in this class and you're getting all this deep meaning. I took my uh, Hebrew and Greek class at 7.30 in the morning, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, <laughs> and I didn't feel God at all. So <laughs> what you're getting is beautiful. <laughs> and now you like, learned two new <laughs> yeah, words, two Karav words. and Shema. I'll be honest with you. If I took one of those tests right now, I would absolutely fail. <laughs> but isn't that really the beauty of college? You study just enough to get it right in the moment. And then like, I have I no love idea what it. I'm doing. But I know you hear from the Lord, so it's fine. That's Cause, it, bro. Because all we need is some Pharisees <laughs> over here listening and be like, he bro. just said he does not know Hebrew. He, he doesn't know. He still <laughs> knows the Lord, y'all. <laughs> it's called Google. Thank you, Jesus. God, then Google. We're good. Um, I'll say this, too. You know what I what I think? This is a little bit controversial, is I really want to redeem the word humble in the church because there's a lot of there's a lot Ooh, of yes, there, let's there's a go lot of there. people that aren't creating content or putting out what they want to because they feel prideful and they're like I don't want people to look at me and I'm like well how are people going to see Jesus because he's not here so like to to see him they have to see you so somebody gave me this definition the other Ooh. day that blew my mind like it blew my freaking mind they said they said humility is not being hidden they said humility is knowing your source. Come on. I know. I was like, what? That tr- that changes everything. Wow. So, so so the reason people really don't put out content is because either you think your content's trash or uh, you, you just, you know, you're saying you don't want people to look at you, which really means you actually do. But you don't know your source because if you did, if you what you were actually putting out would help people, you would just put it out. You would create as much as you could. You would you would dig deep within and begin to uh, pour out whatever was within you. Come on. But a lot of people right now are trying to be like, well, I just don't want to be prideful, and I just and people who are are doing that are wasting time. So I'll let you know. Well, let's speak on to that because you were somebody who was like, I believe in you, and there were so many things behind the scenes I was creating, but I was afraid to release because I was like, what are people gonna think? But I think I bought into the misconception of what humility is. Yeah. And I remember somebody being like, well, the stuff you're producing, it's all about you. And I was like, no, I'm challenging people to look within or look up. And that was a sermon series I got to preach. Look up, look up to Jesus. But it's interesting because I think, and this is where I'm curious, I'm sure if, if pastors are listening, I've had pastors go, is it about you though? Right? Which that fear or kind of speaking into like, what well, that I shouldn't produce content, that we mm-hmm. shouldn't be out in public. But I think you're speaking of something. If Beyonce can come and be out in public and lead, have followers follow her, why do we act like in the church that it's a sin? Well, we don't have to look at Beyonce. Look at David. 95% of those psalms are him talking about God, about him. Come on. You know what I mean? Like that, go read it. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's talking about his experience with God. As a matter of fact, all of... Like some of these books in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, like Nehemiah was like, I need to really not make this about me. So I'm going to call the book Nehemiah. <laughs> Ooh. You know, Jonah, I'm going to make this book not about me. So I'm going to call it. Well, if it's named after you, isn't it about you? Yes, it's God through me. How else are they going to see? He's not here. The Holy Spirit's here working through me in me. You know what I mean? Well, who named the books, though, in the Bible, though? Uh, well, it's a letter. Yeah, like it's a, it's letter, a letter from Nehemiah. It's, they're Nehemiah. Just writing it's called their Nehemiah. thoughts. Right, they're Nehemiah's just writing like, their this thoughts. is what happened in my, you know what I mean? It's like. You know what's interesting? Because we're going to go there now theologically. Like, I think when all those people were writing those things, they didn't know that it was going to be something that we were going to, but they were just being who they were and expressing themselves in the format that they in had that then, in, in that, that time. time. And so for us, if the format in which and we're expressing div- ourselves but, but in not, that time. But you miss, you don't miss this part. It's divine, though. Like, the Lord was inspiring them to do that. You know what I think is crazy? Come that on. We, that we would expect God to speak divinely back then and not right now. Because there are churches that literally believe he doesn't speak. Yeah. 
but but he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right. So if he spoke divinely back then, why is he not speaking divinely right now? There's stuff that I've heard, whether it's been a song, because we know music translates, or a poem, or mm-hmm. I've seen, like this happened to me, maybe it's because I'm older and I'm appreciating the art a little bit more, and uh, I had to dream of being an art collector until I saw how much pieces cost. But um, I'm, I'm paying attention you to different your works. <laughs> like, I'm paying attention uh, to different works. I'm like, well, my daughter's going to color a picture of Barney or something. I'm going to hang that up. But like, I'm looking at it's these pictures. For 20K. And, uh, <laughs> no, just <laughs> and I'm and I'm seeing this stuff, and I'm like, okay, I sense the Lord in that. Ooh, come on! Right, like, yeah. or I hear a song, uh, and I'm like, wow, the Holy Spirit's all that stuff. Like, it's divine inspiration. Now, I'm not yeah. holding songs that we create today in the same light as the Bible, but what I am saying is that God divinely still speaks. Yeah. And the fact of even being like, well, I'm not going to put it out because I don't know what people are going to say, is like, you just made it about you. The thing you were hoping not to do, you just did. <laughs> just put mm-hmm. it out and let it inspire people to run to him and to be about him. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I just really, I'm really passionate about that right now because the majority of young leaders that I'm talking to are going, I just don't want it to be about me. So they're not doing anything. Right. And by doing nothing, you're doing something. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Mm-hmm. So I just, that, those are like the three things I'm constantly thinking about right now. So you didn't ask me about any of it, but that's what I'm I love about. it. I love that that's yeah. what you're sharing. Yeah. I want us to close out on, because I have, I'm sure women are going to be listening to this. Yes. And you are a huge advocate for lifting up. I've seen, first off, your wife, Joanna, Pastor Joanna, is an incredible speaker, incredible leader. But what would you want to say, I guess, to the... There are, I do feel like women kind of pioneering, stepping into ministry, but still having to overcome those barriers of like, should I, should I not? Like, you're somebody who's spoken to me, like, go for it. Yeah. I think, I think I'm passionate about championing women because I'm passionate about building the army. You know, like the arm, like, not to be cheesy, but like the army of the Lord. We need everyone we can get in this fight in winning people to Christ. So to disqualify half of the army right off the rip is ridiculous. You know, the script, the prophet Joel said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Come on. You know what I mean? Um, I can sit here and debate with you and give you countless examples of how the Lord appeared to women first. Like, especially when Jesus was raised from the dead, he appeared to those women first. And they went and told the disciples they were given instruction, right, that Jesus gave them. Uh, I can tell you about the woman at the well who, if we read in Christian history books, becomes St. Fotini. I can tell you about the household of Chloe. Paul, when he's writing in Philippians, he's talking about the household of Chloe, right? What do you mean the household of Chloe? I thought it was the household of Chloe's husband. No, she was the spiritual leader of that moment. Mm, uh, anyway, but come on. She was leading a house church. But anyway, I, I just, um, my message to women would be don't hide behind your spouse. That's what I love about my wife. She's not interested in hiding behind me. Come on. She's not interested. Like, she champions my ministry. She benefits from my ministry. But she's not. My ministry isn't a crutch for her. She is thriving and moving and leading on her own. Actually, this weekend is the first weekend where we're both in two different states preaching at two different conferences. She's in Alabama. I'm in Wisconsin. So, and there's multiple of those events coming. And it, she's not getting to speak at this event because she's the wife of Peter Reeves. She's getting to speak at this event because she's Joanna Reeves. Mm-hmm. You know, and that matters. So, like, don't don't just try to sit in the shadows and 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 find a place to be quiet, or even just rage and try to do things because you're a woman. Do it because you're hearing from God Come and because on. you understand what's going. You know, I, I I champion women. I also don't think I think best people play. You have said that, and that makes people feel uncomfortable because they're like, well, I no, I'm like, well, if you're the best at what you do, yeah, you then have earned the right to be a part of doing whatever it is we're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, so. That's what I would say. Be the best. Fight to be the best. Be the best. Yeah. I feel like on that note, (laughs) I just want to thank you for being in my life. I'm so grateful that obedience, or now the word Gemma, (laughs) hearing from God so close enough and then walking in that space, led me to you to be discipled by you because I've learned so much. And some of my favorite moments have been just sitting in meetings where you open up with scripture before we get into the practicals, before we get into you leading us and what to do. You're spiritually leading us first, right? Um, And thank you for just being here and all the things that you do. I'm grateful. There's a story coming on mine, so I think I'm just going to share it. I remember during some of my hardest moments, you did lead with grace and you spiritually parented. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was so new. 
um, that I think that when people are walking broken or having a hard time or people in process as they're becoming who God, more of who they already are, right, made in God's image, but more of the way God intended them to be and kind of pruning and cutting away the things that they've caught on from the world. You provided space for that. And I'm really grateful because I think who I am two years ago versus who I am today, a lot of that comes from discipleship, being discipled by a spiritual father who had grace, compassion, created moments, care, but also called out the gold and called out the leader in me. And so I'm grateful. Um, Thank you. I hope that this podcast does the same in a small way or a large way for other people. Yeah. It's been an honor. Yeah, I'm really thankful. Really thankful for you. And as always, I believe in you. (laughs) I believe in you too. (laughs) And on that note, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. (laughs) I like. This is cool, man. What a cool man.